Greetings! I am Tantus Nara van Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. Today we're going to continue our talk about 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Today I'm going to bring in some more rules in it. I'm getting into the combat rules finally. We're going to get into some basic rules of combat and start talking about the different things you need to know about when fighting it out in your Dungeons and Dragons games. So let's just dive right into it. So the first thing you're going to do is when you're getting into a combat, you're going to have to determine if there's a surprise or not. Taking surprise just means that someone is surprising you, they can take their actions on a turn, and you don't get any. You're just going to be like, oh my god, I don't know what's going on, someone's attacking me. Now to determine that, it's going to be perception versus stealth. Now the amount of what kind of stealth is being rolled, what kind of perception is going to be rolled, it's very circumstantial, but that's the basic idea. This one team might be trying to be stealthy, the other team has to make a perception to notice it. Otherwise, they're probably just going to run into each other and see each other. It's, if you're just walking along, ba-bam! battle. Now once you're getting into combat you have to establish the position of all the characters. Regardless of his enemy, friend, or your character itself, you have to know where the position is. Once you've determined position, you roll initiative. Rolling initiative is a d20 roll and adding your dex modifier. Now other things like spells and special abilities and feats, if you're allowing the optional rule of feats, can possibly add bonuses to initiative, but most people are just going to take a d20 roll plus their dexterity modifier. You arrange it from highest to lowest, and then you go in order from highest to lowest down the list, and when everybody's done, you start doing it again, and you keep taking turns like that and repeating it over and over again. Now on your turn, you can make a movement, you can do an action, and you get a bonus action if you have any of them you can take. Now, of course, there are some sort of other things you can do on your turn. You can make flourishes, you can do a little speaking, and there's a list of other small actions you can take, which you're allowed to do one of on your turn that don't that count as part of any other kind of action you do. Things like opening a door would be part of just your moving around, that you can be like, move up, open door, keep moving. That that open door would not technically interrupt you, because you can split it up. Now, if something should give you a reaction, you are allowed one before the start of your next turn. Which means that, like, if I have an action that's a reaction, it would be not on my turn, it would be a reaction to someone else. I would be allowed one before my next turn. Now, I did talk about movement a little bit before, but here's some other things you have to know about. When using your movement, especially in combat, you can split it up between attacks. If I have one attack, I can move, attack, and move again. If I have more than one attack, I could move, attack, move, attack, move, as long as I'm splitting up some movement in between those attacks. I could just move, I'll do all my attacks if I have more than one attack, and then move again. Now, you can also split different types of movement. If you have different types of movement, you would split them according to what you have. Like, if I've used half of my movement to get up to here, then I switch to another type of movement I have. I would have only have half of that movement available. You would have to ask your... This might involve some math, depending on how well you want to split it up, but traditionally, you're going to maybe only split it in two. Um, if your, your DM will tell you if you're being a little crazy with what you want to try to do, and might give you penalties like being on disadvantage if you want to go really crazy and do something ridiculous with all the types of movements you can do. Now you could pass through difficult terrain. Difficult terrain would take up some of your movement. It means you could move less through difficult terrain. Traditionally it means that for every foot you move, you'd have to use an extra foot of it. That means you basically move half speed through difficult terrain. Now you can drop free to the ground, you can drop to the ground just for free. That means I could drop down at any time. Standing up will take a half of my movement at any time. Now again, you can also crawl. Crawl takes up half of your speed, meaning for every foot you want to crawl, it takes up an extra foot. Your movement might incur opportunity attacks. You're moving around through someone's space that they're threatening can do that. Now you can move more than just around someone. If something's two size categories larger than you, you can move through its square, through its space, without any problems. Again, you'd probably still incur the opportunity attacks, but it would be just mean it's so big I could move under its legs. Now they do give basics of flying if you want to bring that in. Most of the time you're not going to worry too much about that, especially as characters. Monsters will have to worry about flying more. It's movement in 3D space, which kind of opens up a whole new can of worms when you're playing a game. Now they do list the sizes in here, because it comes up there, it gives you the, the sort of statistics based on those sizes. There's, you can be tiny, small, medium, large, huge, or gargantuan. Now, these aren't what your character is going to be. These are the sort of things you're going to encounter are traditionally most of these sizes. Things of other sizes could exist, but they have them sort of specially ruled out. Uh, and they just mention these here. Now, the book does give the option if you're going to use a grid to play with. Most of the time, you're not going to have to worry about it. When you're establishing position, you're more establishing the position that I might be 15 feet from that person, 5 feet from my friend, who's to my left sort of thing. I'm just describing it that way. 
but there are times where it might be important or it might be actually needed to put everything onto some kind of grid, which is represented by five foot squares that represents, you know, movement around a board like that. There can be times where that's actually almost needed. Most of the time you're not going to have to worry about it. That comes into play where there's a lot of need for tactical movement around a board might be requirements for a grid. And the last thing I want to do mention today is that you can squeeze through space smaller than you need to. They do have rules for it in the book. It is something you can do. So you can squeeze through something if you really need to. And of course it gives you penalties based on combat, so you don't really want to fight while squeezing. But it does tell you what you would need to do if you somehow like have to squeeze to escape. It mentions it in the book. So this is the basics of combat for today. There are more things I want to go over, but I've just delved into combat for now. If you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave it in the comments below. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. It's a great way of showing your support for the channel, for the Empire. Please subscribe if you already haven't. We're always looking for more members, more citizens of the Empire. Please share this video if you know anybody that would learn anything from it or would enjoy it. And until next time, I bid you farewell.